What? Jeez. Careful, Dennis. It's a piece of crap, Arnie. Oh, but she could be fixed up. Yeah, she could be real tough. Forget it, Arnie. This thing's got 43,000 miles on it. Probably 143. I don't care. I bet the thing won't even start. She'll start. You'll need these. How much do you want for her? I mean, whatever it is, it's not enough. Jeez, Arnie. This time on Graveyard Cars, we reveal the complete restoration of our B7 Blue 1970 Challenger RT 446 pack. From paint to drivetrain and the final road test. Witness the transformation of this Challenger RT from a 383 Blue Beauty to a 446 pack B7 Beast. The unburied dead, the unburied dead are coming back to life, are coming back to life. Self-proclaimed Mopar master Mark Warman and his protege painter Will Scott get paid to bring Mopar muscle cars back from the dead. They work with Mark's daughter Alyssa and his cousin Dougie. They're willing to travel anywhere to retrieve a customer's car, detailing how it lived its life and how it died. After that, they bring it back to make it look just like it did the day it was born. Right now, I'm getting ready to get the first coat of color going on a Mente's car. A Mente's car is going B7. It's the first time we've done a B7 car here. Uh, so I'm kind of excited to do it because it's a little bit darker than the B5, but both colors are really gorgeous. This is a popular color, so uh, PPG's got this one just dialed down. So I order my three gallons, they send it to me, I mix it up, do a quick spray out to make sure that it looks good, and then we're spraying. Right now we're getting ready to start the kind of the final fit and finish on our 1970 B7 Dodge Challenger. Uh, it's just super important to make sure every nut bolt is in the correct spot, making sure your gaps are good. We put it on the bin pack to relieve some of the pressure that uh, to relieve the sag that happens sometimes when it's on a whirly jig. Uh, so with the Mente's car, it's one of the few that we've had here that they come in, is it running, driving, the car had been done in the 80s or 90s. Looked good, but wasn't quite up to our standard. So we brought the car in, and just like every other one, we dip them, start all over, and now he's got a nice, clean, all-original uh, Challenger. 
So we get it up there, we relieve that pressure, and then just go around just fine tuning the whole thing because once it's everything set, it stays that way through the rest of the process. So when we take it off the bin pack, it will sag, but you have to trust in what you did before. So when you get the car painted, buffed out, and it's done, it looks great. It might be off a little bit, but once you put it over an assembly side and put it back on the bin pack where it's got more stability underneath it, all those gaps look great. We got our first fender hung. Everything looks good, double check, signed off on. So now it's time to move to the next. So we got the final fit and finish done on our 1970 Challenger. Everything came out just the way it should. So at this point, we're gonna roll it in the booth and get some color going on it. Uh, right now, we have our 1970 V7 Dodge Challenger in the booth. We're trying to get this car done. It's supposed to be 100 degrees today. And being that it's a metallic, the sooner we can get it done, uh, when it's cooler outside, the metallic will lay out better. So I'm trying to hurry up, get it done, so that way we have a nice, clean paint job in the end. This is the first time we've done a V7 car, uh, especially on a Challenger, so I'm excited to get it done and see how it comes out. This was kind of a rush job because once it hits 100 degrees, I just can't get that paint to lay down nice. So it was a little bit of a challenge to get it done on a shorter time frame. Uh, the color laid down great. We were able to beat the heat, get the clear coat done today. So I'm getting ready to head in the booth right now and start the cut and buff process on our 1970 Challenger. I'm gonna start with 800, then I'm gonna go to 1200, 1500, 2000, then 3000. So the car's already been pretty much been cut, except it hasn't been done with 2000 yet. And you can see it's still shiny through here because I stay off that line. So I do this just to protect it. Uh, challengers are a little more tricky because right, you got a real sharp style line uh, where a CUDA doesn't. So you kind of got to watch that line. So a lot of times I'll just mask off the line when I do my sanding and buffing to ensure that we don't burn. So it's a little, it takes a little bit more time than some of the other cars, but the end result's the same. I mask up all the edges just because I don't want to burn it. Um, because once you burn it, then sometimes it can be challenging trying to fix it. So I just would rather be safe than sorry, make sure those edges are all protected. And then that way I don't have to fix anything later. If you catch the edge, whether it be when you're sanding it or with uh, the buffer, if you don't have those edges protected, you burn it. Is what that means is you actually sand off the three or four coats of clear coat, the however many coats of color that you have on there, and you can go right down to the primer. So you can have something that's actually an inch or two long, and it'll be primer underneath there. So you can literally take the paint off all the way down to primer on that. So that's why I just put the tape down to make sure I don't have any problems at all. Now that the sanding is all done completely, I start the buffing process. I get all the dust, get the whole car wiped down so it's a nice, clean, fresh surface to start with. It was one of those things that has really sharp edges, so I made sure I went through the whole car, masked them up, went from 800 all the way out to 2000 in the finer grits in between, so that way when it came time to buff it, it really buffs quickly. I start with a wool pad, compound number one, and I use that wool pad over the whole car. it's the most aggressive. So it'll actually get the shine back a lot quicker than the other pads, but it also can give you the burns really quick. So that's why we just mask it off to make sure that we're good through that phase. So we start very aggressive with the wool pad before we move on to the next. These cars are a process. Uh, Mark is very meticulous you know, on every nut and bolt has to be OE. If it's not OE, it's because a customer requested something else. But these cars take time. Trying to find qualified people to come in here and do what Mark and I ask is hard enough as it is. So right now I'm doing this by myself. So I have two weeks into getting that Challenger looking perfect to come over to assembly. Well, while I'm doing that, I have nobody else helping me currently 
out there in the shop, so you fall behind on stuff like this. So it's impossible to try to get a car done every episode. If you were to look at those cars done every episode a year later, they're not gonna look nearly as good as what we produce at a slower rate. The buffing process, like I said, it's kind of a tedious thing, so you just have to slow down, take your time, protect your edges like we always do. I'm gonna grab George and roll the car out there. Normally I do the washing by myself, but on these hot days, that compound dries quick, the water dries quick. So I'll grab him to kind of tag team it and we can get the process done quicker. George has come a long ways. Uh, you know, I think he's been with us for four years now. And when I didn't, we didn't even get along actually for the first couple years, but he's really stuck it out and actually learned a lot. So he's kind of like my right hand guy when I need something or questions, like something I don't even know. Um, I usually go to him with everything for help around the shop. Um, even though it's hot, you don't have to worry about it burning the paint. I don't get that close to the panel and we're kind of just a good once over because George has went through and pretty much done all the leg work already. So you're really not sitting on one spot and just running it on there. It's kind of an overall wash. See, when I was a kid, I used to wash these cars and then Mark would stand here and he'd make sure I was soaked by the time it was all over. So I'm a much better teacher than uh, Mark ever was. George isn't all wet. I'm not making a mess out of him. I got to be honest, I appreciate that. You're welcome. He would make me hold the seat belts out and then he would run that pressure washer right up to my hand, which would totally soak me. And then sometimes it'd be funny to hit my hand, which that hurts. So now that we have our own teams and I got my own guys, I'm not gonna go with the path that Mark does. I don't give a damn what you think you are entitled to. You got everything I did! So I have George out there with me. We washed the car. I didn't soak them. I'm trying to treat them better than Mark does. So Mark believes in really beating them down and then bringing them back up so they can really appreciate being down. So with my team, I just try to, right now they're, the, they're like the D team. And because they all showed up this week, I've moved them up to a D plus. So in my way, it's very easy for them to rise quicker. And then by doing that, they also take better care of me in the long run. Uh, back in the old days, I used to bicker with everybody here. Uh-oh. Hey boss. Give him a hard time, because I used to go the same path as Mark. But now I don't go his path anymore. Did you get a name tag, George? Uh-oh, yep. Now we're all about you know keeping people higher, build morale, keep them in a good mood all the time. That way they perform better. George and I did a great job. He did a great job. It's pretty basic on what you have to do. You just have to be thorough. The car is completely washed, looks great, rolled back into the booth, chamois down, and ready for the next process. We've already done the paint work, the cut and buff is done, it's all been washed up and it's completely spotless now. Now is the time where we go in, mask the car up completely, and then start the undercoat process. Not every car gets undercoated. The ones that we do were factory done already, so we just make sure we always replicate that. It's nice to have it on there because it does quiet the noise down a little bit. Um, I don't put it on as heavy as the factory does, so I like it to look a little bit cleaner so you can see the quality of repairs we've done when it comes to putting in floor pans and whatnot. But it's a quick process, um, prevents you know the underside of the car getting beat up, and we do it to almost every car here. I like the undercoating. I think it looks great and it does serve a purpose. Uh, if it was my car particularly, I would want to paint it, but not the factory gray. I would like to see the underside of the car painted just as good as the outside of the car. The undercoating is actually a very quick process. We have a great setup. It allows you to go in there once the car is masked up and just spray. So it's just the most important thing is to make sure you get in all the cracks and crevices, cover the whole entire thing. It takes about 20 minutes to do, and it does take a good week or two to actually fully dry. The car looks amazing. The undercoat went perfect as usual. So I'll give that about 30 minutes to kind of dry a little bit, unmask the car completely, and roll it over to the assembly shop. Stay tuned. There's more to come in the restoration and transformation of this former 383. Okay, lowering down. Second floor mannequins and apparel. The ghouls install the new 440 drivetrain. Oh, oh. Hold on, Mark. And. Will has a problem with the transverse stripe. There's no bumblebee stripe on it. As far as a bumblebee car, remember? Not like a decal? Our graveyard is filled with classic Mopar muscle, the prized possessions of hardworking Americans. Most people saved up 
and waited to get their dream car. Something sporty, glamorous, exciting, and available on their budget. Big enough to be comfortable, not a subcompact, and a broad choice of equipment to meet their specific needs. They were eager to purchase the Sport Compact that was all new for 1970. The one that offers all new value, the Challenger. This car, awaiting its own restoration, makes the scene like a bolt from the blue. In Dodge tradition, the Challenger is roomier and features many styling options that win over the Mustang, Camaro, and Firebird. The Challenger is the dream come true, making it our Corpse of the Week. Our 1970 Dodge Challenger RT. This is a B7 blue car. It has a white bumblebee striped black interior. Originally, it was a 383 four-speed car. The customer wants me to convert it over to a 446-pack four-speed car. So that's what we've been in the process of doing. The drivetrain is all built out. We've been assembling what we can on the car until the drivetrain was done. Uh, the other day, we got the deck lid on it. We're starting to do the final sheet metal. So the last piece of final sheet metal is gonna be our hood. That's a three-guy job. It's two guys, one on each side, one at the front holding the balance. It's just better to be safe than sorry. Rooster? Yes, Mark. Okay. Alrighty. What? Okay, race straight up in the air. These hoods are big and they're heavy, so it is good to have three people doing it because it's very easy for a hood to jump or move a little bit and chip a fender. So it gets a little tense, but when you have three people just taking your time, making sure you're doing a good job, it usually goes fairly quick. Now, Will, I have a question for you. No, you don't. Yes, I do. Anyway, I was working with the greenhorn. We were putting the deck lid on. Something jumped out at me. I couldn't help but notice. What's that? There's no bumblebee stripe on it. Car's a bumblebee car, remember? Not like a decal? No, it's not like a decal, it's a painted on stripe. V9W to be specific, because it's supposed to be white. Now, I'm just wondering why you didn't put it on there, because it's supposed to go on underneath the paint. Why didn't you tell me? <laughs> what, Will? Why Can you didn't... lift up in the front a little bit? Why didn't you tell me? Tell you that it's supposed to get a stripe on it? How am I supposed to know if it gets a painted stripe? Be because the same reason every other car is the broadcast sheet hanging on the side of the car. What do you think, there was a guy on the assembly line, handsome guy, looked a little bit like Tom Cruise, running up and down the assembly line telling people, oh, don't forget to put stripe on. Don't forget to put well, fenders on. Know. That's a build sheet. You just put that it's on the there. Word build. No, I did not. That's been on there since the car went through the metal shop. <laughs> it's not been on there once, sir. Not one time. You literally just put that on there. Why would I just put that on there? I I'm Because it's part you. of your game. No, there is it's no part, game. It's all a game with okay, you. Okay, can we just close the hood? That broadcast sheet, I haven't seen that. He probably literally today printed that up and then threw it on there. Because I had no clue that we were supposed to drop a stripe on it. And those are like things that he, like when he's walking through the shop, say, oh yeah, don't forget or give me a heads up. Because I have no fender tag, I have no broadcast sheet. The only thing I know is it goes B7. I'll have to do a little last minute dial in on it. Push the back edge of that hood down. Yeah, I just got to drop the back of the hinges down a little bit. Okay. Uh, the hood looks good, and he's a little bit more tweaking. We leave that for Mark to do. You know, he's a perfectionist at it, and he's actually really good at it. So he'll uh, dial this thing in, but color looks great. Everything matches like it should. Looking uh, looking amazing. Oh. Okay, are we done? You're dismissed. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> well, you're not done. The V9W stripe, as you know. The white stripe? Next time, read the broadcast sheet. But the, put a broad... There was what? a broadcast not, sheet. It was not there. Through. I've done this whole car. From start to finish. Listen, I've made mistakes too. I didn't realize at the time I was a young, I was a greenhorn. I didn't realize that the way they did it was like before the car ever got purple or blue, if it got a bumblebee stripe on it, they painted the back of the car almost to the front edge of the deck lid. Then they did a reverse mask, masked off the rally stripes, painted the car, pulled it off, and they were done. Okay. So when you run your finger across the factory stripe, if it was brand new, right what? You wouldn't feel the line. Of course you'd feel the line. We're not clear coating over it, it's an enamel paint. Can I finish now? If you ran your finger over it, you would notice that the white paint is lower than the other paint, okay? Because the other paint's on top of it. That would make it higher, okay? And in this case, it's gonna be reversed. Right. 
So all I need you to do is keep that millage way, way down. Absolutely. Okay, so at the very leading edge, I want one coat of clear. I don't want three coats of polyurethane clear. I want one, and it has to be clean, unlike most paint jobs, so I can get that I can take down care of it. flat. I can take care of it. Now, I will get you the original engineer drawings, if that would help. Sure. You'll have to be able to read. I do. Okay, good. If you couldn't, for some reason, read, we done. There's a yellow car out back for the factory bumblebee strike on it. That'd probably be easier for you than reading all those pesky numbers. 16, this, 8, that. <laughs> you know what I'm yeah, You see it. what I mean? So the question is, did I hang the broadcast sheet on the car after the fact? I'm not going to confess to anything. I'm not going to deny anything. Let me ask you this. How can Scooby-Doo talk? Go-kart Mozart checking out the weather chart. What's that? JFK. Nobody's ever going to figure out, you know, what was it Oswald acting alone? Was it was it the Russians? Was it was it the mob? You know. Well, that's the question. Right now we're getting ready to install the drivetrain in our 1970 Dodge Challenger RT. I want to start out by just talking about some of the things that make this unique and correct for a 1970 Challenger. The Challenger started life as a real RT, 383 four-speed car. The owner always wanted a 446-pack four-speed car. So he commissioned me to restore the car, but when we go back together with the engine, transmission, rear end, suspension, make it exactly the way a 446 pack car would have been in 1970. So you guys ready to go to school? Uh-huh. Yeah. Let's start with the clutch and fan blade assembly. The gentleman who owns this car wants it to be an A34, uh -huh. which also means it has max cooling heavy duty max cooling, which means it gets a 26 inch radiator, a fan shroud, this fan blade, uh -huh. and this clutch fan. Uh -huh. The 2806070, that is the correct fan from 1968 to 1971. That is a correct reproduction of the very, very difficult to find in good shape fan. Because it's at the front of the engine. It's sucking stuff through that radiator for 50 years. It gets the living tar beat out of it. Yeah. So to find nice ones, this was a great investment for Tony to start making. This unit right here is correct for our 1970. What is this item called? Fuel vapor separator. Fuel vapor oh separator. Oh, oh Rooster's boy. coming in. <laughs> oh, Dougie's coming in. That's right. This is the intake side. It's 3 8 It's the intake side goes back to the fuel tank. The fuel gets sucked into here and then pumped out to here and up to the carburetors. But there's excess fuel, there's excess vapors. What happens to those? This is an early version of emission control. This little quarter inch return line goes back all the way to the tank and puts all that extra stuff back in the tank again. So it can come back up this and be reused again. So it really is kind of an efficient little setup. Yeah. They didn't use it on the 383 slant six of small box, but they did use it on this. So the other things that I harp on you all the time about is making sure that we have the right nuts and the right bolts, right? So how do we know that this little bracket that holds the alternator and these bolts that hold it in place are right? Any bolt would hold them this long enough to work, right? Mm -hmm. We look carefully, there's some things we'll notice. Don't take for granted that this alternator is just on here. This is not an air conditioning car. You couldn't get air conditioning on a 444 speed anything. So whether there was a six pack on top of the engine or there was a four barrel on top of it, you couldn't get a 440 or four speed in air conditioning. So that's already off the charts. If it was air conditioning, this would be a dual pulley. It would take two belts. So this is the correct single pulley. It is also black in color. We learned in our Corpse of the Week that the 1970 Challenger was the dream car hardworking Americans were after. Glamorous, sporty, and budget friendly. The Gator Grain Vinyl Top was a new option on the 1970 Challenger. And what other Dodge was it? The Monaco, the Dart, the Charger. Think you know? Find out after the break. Welcome back, ghouls. 
we learned that the 1970 Challenger was equipped with many styling options. One option was the new Gator Grain Vinyl Top. What other Dodge car was available with a new Gator Grain Top? If you guessed the Charger, you were right. For Dodge in 1970, the new Gator Grain Vinyl Top was only available on the Challenger and the Charger. You'll notice this bolt right here that goes through the correct replica heater hose bracket. This is the correct one that they started life with, that most of the guys, when they changed these hoses out, threw this on the ground and it never got put back on. This is original. That bolt, you see what's in the middle of that bolt? The H? That's a Highland bolt. Okay. That is the correct original Highland bolt. Look at this one with the serrated top on it with these little teeth in it. That is the correct bolt. It's very short and it's specific. It's made that way to go into that hole. See the word top here so you can't get it upside down because <laughs> I know where you're from. <laughs> and then down here you'll see the L5. That is the correct bolt that holds the lower part, the pivoting part of the bracketry. When was that car built? Uh, September 2nd. Of what year? 1969. Very good. So that means everything on this engine, if it's dated, should be dated before that date, right? Or correctly concurrent with that date. Spark plug wires. These are replicas of the original Chrysler Corporation wires, a black with the yellow writing. If we know that January, February, and March would be the first quarter of 1969, what quarter should these spark plug wires be? The second or the Closest third, right? to the production date without going over. It's like the price is right. The okay. closest date without so the going over it, the third quarter, that's right. And so when you look very carefully right here, what do you see? H3Q69. Third quarter of 69. That's how accurate it has to be. These are the correct heater hoses with the correct part numbers on them. This is the correct upper radiator hose with the part number on it. And this is the correct lower radiator hose with the part number on it. So on that side, that's about it. Just a couple things real quick over here. Since this is going into an A34 car, it has a 410 gear ratio. Mm -hmm. Mopar made it mandatory that any of their axle package cars that had a gear ratio of 3.55 to one or lower got a power steering cooler. That's called being accurate. So that is a power steering cooler that was mandatory with it. Also, the other thing that's mandatory. This brakes? This brakes. Oh. So you are standing by, good. So what we gotta do is we gotta locate these front leaf spring hangers into the holes near the torque box area, okay? Bring the okay, front of the that, axle okay. up a little. Yep, just like that. And I'll come down just a little bit. Okay. Beautiful. All right, we got everything in there. The nuts are in position and loose. That's good. We need to lower the car down and put the rear actual shackles in place. That's good. How we doing, guys? All right, got it. Awesome. Okay, start the nut and the washer, that's all you gotta do. Like it? Good job, guys. Looks good. Let's go ahead and do the engine and transmission. Then we can put the wheels and tires on it. We'll call it a morning. All right, let's get her done. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so here's what we're doing right now. Mark has told me what the color is that goes on the back of this car. Um, I just like to come in and double check, especially for the fact that Mark has went and purchased the original books from 1970 and 1971 uh, from PPG. It's a great thing to have. Right now we have a lot of the photocopies, but these are the actual originals. So we flip through, find the 1970. Um, we have the W1, which is the white. So that's our white that we'll be using. And one of the best parts about this is when you go to the back, it actually lists what everything was for with these colors. Still to come, the ghouls install the newly built out 440 drivetrain. Will lays out the very unique white transverse stripe, despite Mark's interference. Now see, now don't really follow him. Just quit, quit filming, because this is where he likes to start popping in. 
and the Dodge Driving Duo take this B7 beast for a road test. No hands. <laughs> Okay, let's do it. I'm gonna run the hoist. Load her in there, load her in there. I'm gonna give you the eyeball line. I can usually call it within a millimeter. All right. Can't tell your colors, but apparently measurements. Go this way with the front of it. Oh, my bad. Stop there. You probably could need maybe an inch forward, not much, right there. Usually if this pose touches that support, that's about the right forward for it. Okay, lowering down. Second floor mannequins and apparel. And okay, we're gonna hit on the passenger side. Kick it over a little bit. Yeah, it can go over about a half an inch. Right there. Yeah, okay. Did you um, get that, Pete? Put. Ooh. Oh, oh. Hold on, Mark. Okay. Okay, lowering. Wow, we actually cleared everything except for oh. a shock. Oh, Good. You go up just a little bit. I got the shock. It'll pull down. Pull it down. Pull it down. straight out the front. Yep. There you go. So right now everything okay. is installed as far as the engine is completely restored and installed. Pass on transmission did the Hemi four speed. It's all done and ready to go. We'll have to do our assembly line markings on it. That's all that'll be left there. Rear end is in place, which is great. So now they're just making final connections. We'll put the wheels and tires on it, let it down. Then we can get it moved over to Will so he can put the V9W stripe on the back that he seemed to have not been able to read the broadcast sheet for, so. Yeah, Mark. Hi, Dougie. Hi. He does that, that's. Hello. What's wrong? <laughs> so once we have it all brought up here like we do, we have our amount already put in at 15 ounces. You just go to label. So has everything in it, so now we're good to go mix it. getting ready to lay the stripe out on this. It was supposed to be done ahead of time, but Mark Hill hid the build sheet from me, so I had no clue that it got a stripe. He thought it'd be funny to hide it from me. So I really had nothing to go off of, because originally we were supposed to paint this white and then uh, go back, mask the white, uh, the white off, do the blue. <laughs> so we're doing it a little backwards, but that's all right. Getting it taken care of now. Now see, now don't really follow him. Just quit, quit filming, because this is where he likes to start popping in. Yep, see, wait. He... This color is Spinnaker White, and the paint coat is W1. It's a creamy white. Uh, when you first spray it, it looks like it's really, really off, but once you unmask the car and look at it, it is it is a creamy white, but it's not as noticeable once you get the blue. All right, ghouls. Another moment to test your knowledge about 1970 Challengers. Chrysler sold over 83,000 Challengers in 1970. True or false? Duster's sales in 1975 surpassed any individual year of Challenger sales from 70 to 74. Are we telling the truth? Find out after the break.
Welcome back, ghouls. Chrysler sold over 83,000 Challengers in 1970, but we claim that Duster sales in 1975 surpassed any individual year of Challenger sales from 70 to 74. Are we telling the truth? Yes, we are. Duster sales beat out any individual year of Challenger sales from 70 to 74. So with our 1970 Dodge Challenger, we're getting close to getting it across the finish line. We're gonna do a fire up on it right now. We have not started this engine. Usually we do an engine test run, but we didn't get an opportunity on this one. So we're gonna check for oil leaks, make sure that it runs, runs well. Uh, before we do that, we'll do a quick system check, make sure that the fluids are topped off and that it's truly ready. Sound good? Yeah. And then fire it up? Uh-huh. Okay. Oil. Doug, you wanna check the antifreeze? Nice and full, look at that, looks good. Are you good? The coolant's good. Okay, and power. Yeah. We're getting fuel. Power steering is full. Okay, Okay. I'm gonna try to start her up. Like Mick Jagger said, start me up. Never stop. Never stop. Okay, go ahead and hook the coil up. All righty. Sounds better. Yeah, almost. Advance the timing a little. All three gauges pegged, and it hasn't ran long enough to do that. So we have something inside there on the wiring that's not right. Yeah. Probably, it could be the CVR, the constant voltage regulator, stuck wide open. Okay. You run it very long like that, and it'll cook those gauges. Gotcha. But the engine runs good. That's very important. I want you to check the CVR inside there. Okay. Uh, if we can get that fixed, we'll fire it back up, top off the radiator, check all the fluid levels, we'll be able to go on a road test. But that thing sounded good. Sounded nice. Good, right, Rooster? Yeah. Nice, huh? Love it. Hey, got a little dance in you? A dance? Hey, do your Frankenstein from the old days. Like this? No, that's not the Frankenstein, man. I was doing all my stuff out on the dance floor, you know? I was moving and I was doing that and I did the rope around in the teapot. Yeah. And it walked like an Egyptian. I was doing oh, that. Yeah. We did and I looked the over and there's fire. Dougie. Mm. Same thing. That was his movement. That was his move. It was called the Frankenstein, man. Recycled jokes. Anyway, I had some moves. I can't show them nowadays because I got told I can't, but trust you me, I had some moves. Doug and I are out on our maiden voyage in the uh, 70 Challenger RT 440 six-pack four-speed. This is a tribute car, originally a 383 Magnum, uh, but we made it into a 440 six-pack because that's what the owner wanted. B7 blue over B5 blue interior. It is a manual transmission that uses the pistol grip shifter. The first two letters of the vehicle identification number are J for Juliet 
and S for special. It has a 410 Super Track Pack rear end, a rally instrument cluster with an 8,000 RPM tachometer, a clock, fuel gauge, temperature gauge, oil pressure gauge, and the speedometer goes up to 150 miles per hour. So this is our, our first trip out. We're just taking off from the shop. Right now it's in third gear, doing about 2,400 RPM. We're averaging about 45 miles an hour. It feels good. See how it pulls here. This is a third gear pull. Feels good, it has a nice pull to it. The steering, look at that. No hands. Arnie Cunningham. <laughs> this car was also a manual steering car that we converted over to power steering. How's it feel? It feels nice. Oh, wow. Power disc brakes, which are mandatory and standard, if you will, with the A34. What's the A34, Doug? What? L31s? That's turn signal indicators. It what's the A, What's the A34 axle package give us? Uh, 410 Dana. That's right. And what front brakes are standard with the 410 Super Track Pack? Disc. Manual or power? Power. That's right. That's right, old Dougie coming out of the gate. Strong now. <laughs> Doing good. Doing Car good. feels yeah. good. Feels nice. We got dual outside mirrors, G36. Wow. These are painted body color, yep. Sounds good. It does. 1,350 CFM, cubic feet per minute of airflow through the three two-barrel Holley carburetors from the factory. Okay, we're gonna shift down to second, which is pretty fast right now. We're doing about 50. nice. Idle's nice, has a nice bump stick to it. We use Comp Cam 284, 484, 284 duration, 44 lift. Sounds nice. Sure does. Got our brand new AMD interior trim panels. Now see, these were impossible to find a while back. Nobody was reproducing them. Well, that's not true. The people that were reproducing them were doing a terrible job and they looked hideous. Oh, these, these, these are, go ahead. These look nice. They do look nice. Wow, this oh, yeah. drives nice, doesn't it? Straight as an arrow. Oh boy. Oh boy, is right. We are back at the ranch. That is a phenomenal road test. Oh. Everything worked like it's supposed to. That's the way they're supposed to work, is exactly like that. I love it. I love it. Yeah. Very nice. Me and the rooster, being <laughs> normal. <laughs> ah. Ah. Kiss my ass.